I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we have a very special guest. A celebrity. Someone who has had direct influence on our lives for eight years now. Well, me eight years, you less than eight years. I'm speaking of Professor Roy Chan, University of Oregon. Late my dissertation chair, but he is no longer my dissertation chair because I'm done, so I can talk all the smack about him that I want now. Uh, Professor Chan, thanks for being here today. Uh, absolutely. I am interested to hear what kind of smack you have to say about me. <laughs> uh, I really got to have this chance to be a guest on your podcast because, as you've just mentioned, uh, Rob just graduated and uh, is going to be moving soon. So I thought it'd be really nice for us to be able to have this chance to kind of talk about the things we love reading. And, and certainly uh, reading Lu Shun is a, is a great place to, to, to kind of spend some time on. Yeah, it's, it's actually really neat talking about Lu Xun now, because in a lot of ways, Lu Xun is how I started my Chinese literary journey, modern one anyway, especially reading, I think the, the true story of Ah Kyu is the first Chinese novel I read all the way through, novella. Kung Yiji for me. And it's nice having Roy here, because Roy is an expert. He's an expert, and he's also one of the few people who has been doing Lu Xun for a long time. Am I right, Roy, that Lu Xun isn't the cool writer to talk about necessarily in the American Academy, right? I think maybe things are changing. Um, absolutely, Julia Lovell's recent translation of Lu Xun published by Penguin created a new kind of readership for Lu Xun. Um, but I think for a while, there was a sense in the American Academy, at least, that Lu Xun was passé. Uh, certainly, Lu Xun's association with the CCP with the Maoist establishment that deified Lu Xun as kind of the patron saint of Chinese literature uh, didn't do him a lot of favors in places like America or Taiwan. Uh, and really, it wasn't until the 80s and 90s where we could look at Lu Xun afresh and kind of see the ways in which he was not overdetermined by the later CCP establishment that tried to kind of mold him in a certain way. Yeah, I, I actually read Lu Xun some in Taiwan, and the copy of, of Lu Xun, the Taiwanese copy I have of him, talks about how how little recognition he has gotten in the academy there, even today. I mean, this book was published in the early 2010s, I believe. Yeah, and you know, just like both of you, for me, Lu Xun was really my entryway into Chinese literature. I was a Russian major in college, and I was doing a PhD program in comparative literature in Berkeley, and I didn't read any Chinese literature really my first year. I was still taking Chinese language classes. And my very first seminar in Chinese literature was in my second year with who would be my advisor, Professor Andrew Jones, and that's when we started reading Lu Xun. Um, and it you know, so I, I was reading him without the baggage, the political baggage, the cultural baggage, the historical baggage that attends to him. And for me, it was something I hadn't really read before uh, in terms of not just Chinese literature, but just really world literature. And I often talk to people for whom reading Lu Xun has been a life-changing experience. You know, I, I think about someone like Carolyn Brown, who you, used to study Chinese literature um, and was a professor for a while, then, then, then did something else with her life, who said that, you know, reading Lu Xun as a uh, black woman was something that just shook her to her core. And even after she retired from her job as, a, as an academic administrator, she went back and wrote a book about Lu Xun and Young that just came out a couple years ago. And so we've had the pleasure of corresponding a little bit about that. And so for me, it's so significant to hear these stories of people for whom Lu Xun really has this kind of connection to us and continues to have these connections that really spans decades of a lifetime, you know, even if we live lifetimes that are far longer than the span that was allotted to Lu Xun. Yeah, and it's one of the things that's remarkable to me about talking about Lu Xun is most of us, if you have any prior exposure to China or Chinese culture, to some extent have to deprogram what they know of Lu Xun when you read him because there's a there's a tendency, at least in China, to position Lu Xun as this great national figure, revolutionary, reformatory. And then you start reading him, and it's very hard to square what you're reading with this kind of overly simplistic idea. And so it forces you, something escapes it. You're just like, there's, okay, something doesn't square. I have to go back. And because you keep getting kicked back and kicked back again, you realize... Now, this is, this is somebody worth exploring in more depth. 
Um, I, I have definitely had the same experience, especially when teaching students from the PRC. You have to kind of, you know, I had been deprogrammed by you, Professor Chan. Kind of, <laughs> I was thinking about Lu Xun on a variety of levels, not just as the the patron saint of, of Chinese literature for the CCP, but for for many of our students who do come from the PRC, that he's still very much that figure, and it, it's a lot of work to try and try and bring the different multiple levels that Lu Xun speaks on out. I think teaching Lu Xun to undergraduates and also to graduate students, you know, you get a sense of how sensitive a reader is in their reaction to the text, right? Mm. Uh, because if they start giving you the kind of platitudes, which, you know, have a ring of truth to them about Lu Xun yeah, as sure. kind of the heroic literary nationalist fighting for the nation, and if that's really the extent of the commentary, then you know that they've missed something. Right. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, this is a good place actually to jump in because we are going to be talking today about possibly the most discussed passage that Lu Xun ever wrote, or at least most discussed section, which is his preface or introduction to the collection War Cry, Nahan, which was a, a collection of a lot of the stuff he had, had published previously, but uh, in the early 20s. Now, the introduction talks about why do I do this? Why do I write literature? Why do I think it's worth investing in this? Because, of course, he started out uh, being trained as a doctor, which is what took him to Japan uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Famously, what drove him to literature, at least according to him in his introduction, a particular episode, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but I assume we're going to talk about the entire introduction because there's a lot more than this in the introduction, it packs a lot in just a few short pages. I mean, it begins by talking about Lu Xun dreaming, which Professor Chan, you, I, I hope, will have have uh, something to say about that. But he sets up this kind of paradigm. I don't, I don't. Know, this kind of conflict between science and traditional Chinese medicine. There is a, a conflict between modernity and a sort of traditional past. There's a conflict between Japan and China. There's, there are all these different interesting conflicts and tensions that, that kind of reign over the text. Professor Chan, what do you see as the most important part of the, the preface? So let's start with the title, this you, which can be translated as self-preface or autobiographical preface. Now, anyone who's read Lu Xun for a while, especially this mature work from 1920 on, knows that there's that's probably meant to be taken ironically. This you, right? This is an account of oneself, an account of one comes to write. And on a superficial level, yes, it is that. But once you start getting into it, you start to wonder, is it? Does he really ever compose an account of his authorship, how he became an author? And in fact, when you start reading this text from the beginning to the end, what you see really is not the establishment of Lucian, the author, but really this equivocation of what it means to take on the burden, to take on the venture of becoming an author. And it asks the question of, you know, I'm a child of the 90s, so listen to Eminem, will the real Lucian please stand up? <laughs> like, when does Lucian begin in this yeah. preface exactly? When it, does it begin when he's a child trying to save his father? Does it begin when he's in Japan? Does it begin when he's a loner in the Shaoxing hostel in Beijing? Does it begin when he's writing for New Youth? There's no real beginning and no real end to this piece. And remember when this is written. This is written after he's finished the stories that would become Nahan, right? So those are stories written between 1918 or so and 1921 collected as a book, and only after the fact is he saying, why have I done what I've done? And that's what this is. It's, why am I doing this? Why have I committed this, 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 this foolhardy sin, crime of writing literature? So at this point, he's famous. He's gone from being a nobody in 1917, doing some translation work and, and a kind of a couple of other things to, to being a, the closest thing to... A literary hero that that China at this point has, and he's looking back on how he came to that point. Uh, Professor Chan is, I mean, there are, there are questions as to how um, historical his account is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's questions about 
what exactly happened in a Japanese classroom. Uh, what was the image that he saw? Was a sword involved? Was a gun involved? This is the, the image you're speaking of is the execution of a Chinese person for spying for the, the Russians. Russians. Yes. Uh, the lantern slide incident. Yeah. That is this key turning point that you know everyone talks about that's taught in classrooms where he decides that, oh, the Chinese nation is not a nation because of the numbness, uh, the, the lack of feeling, the lack of sympathy of the spectators watching one of their countrymen. And of course, the very idea of one of our countrymen, he says, you know, one of the Zhongguo Ren, that's a speculative proposition. Is there such thing as Chinese people at that time? That's the whole point of literature is to create the people through literature uh, in order to kind of heal their spirits rather than their bodies. Uh, absolutely, is that that scene. Uh, that, that kind of becomes a kind of climactic point in this narrative of origins. But it's a climax that is uh, frustrated and evacuated just as instantly within the next paragraph, right? Because th this is 1904, 1905, and the attempt to kind of create a new literature falls flat on its face. Right. And that brings me to this kind of, you know, for, for someone, Lee, that you just said, who was well-known by 1922, why is this text so much about failure? His inability... Um, not just to become an author, but to exercise any kind of true self-determination. Because it begins with this, with him trying to save his father, uh, shuttling between the pawn shop and the, uh, and the herbal pharmacy. And, you know, remember, he's like three years old, four years old. Uh, his head doesn't even reach the top of the counter. It's a visceral image of powerlessness. That's, mm -hmm. that's the emphasis, right? And, and what is he being tasked to do? The responsibility of saving his father. I always talk about this moment to my undergraduates because this is such a vulnerable moment, a traumatizing moment for, for a kid who is tasked with the, the responsibility of trying to save his father and it fails, right? And this kind of leads him into kind of his, his forays into science, into literature. Um, but each and every single time, um, there's a kind of failure that happens. And of course, the most traumatizing failure is not the death of his father. It's the failure of him to become the author of his dreams in 1905 in Japan when he quits medical school and they tried to create this new literary magazine in Tokyo called uh, New Life or Xinxiang, right? Um, but what happens is that uh, a financial backer, you know, draws out, uh, they lose all their funding, and, and the term in, in Chinese, of course, is that um, it became a stillbirth, right? Uh, so in, in the text, it says that this was the stillbirth of our new life, the title of the magazine, right? So, so this image of the stillbirth, that the baby who was never born, uh, is, is a really kind of uh, affecting kind of image. And one of the things to remember about, in, in, when he's in Japan, he starts reading lots of romantic poetry. He starts reading lots of Nietzsche. And he writes this essay about what he calls Mara poetry, uh -huh. where he gives this history of all these romantic poets from Byron to Shelley to Pushkin to Mitskevich. And he's talking about how they summon the dark powers of Mara, uh, which is kind of like Satan. So Satan did appear, does appear. In our oh, audience. there you, you go. Said that Thank Satan you. Was, Satan does appear. Thank you. We had a, this, was a, this was a joke occurring before the podcast. We may get to that later. And so he's going to summon these kind of dark forces in order to make the world anew through poetic address, right? So this is a, an odd combination of romantic uh, 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 romanticism, but also Nietzsche's ideas of the trans, of, of, of the ubermensch, the overman, who through sheer will upends all of the slave morality, the values of the existing society in this Dionysian revel of creativity. And Lu Shun's implication in this essay from 1904-1905 in this Japan parade is that I'm the next Byron. <laughs> I'm it. Yeah. I'm the one. And he, he does write poetry. And of course, he fails. Right. And thank God that he fails yep. because if he hadn't failed, if he had been successful, he would have been a lot like, I think, Guo Moreau. Yeah. You know, very productive, polymath. But we well haven't covered him yet on the podcast for a reason. But not a very, for me personally, like I've taught Guomoro in seminar, not someone I enjoy teaching. You know, that's a, a great thing for Rob and me to remember is that failure is sometimes the route to success because you and I have had <laughs> plenty of failure. Oh, yeah. 
No, but it's interesting that that you've grounded this whole introduction in the the failure, his perceived failure anyway, to rescue his father. Mm -hmm. Because one of the one of the things I find absolutely fascinating with Lu Xun and any of the major writers of the period is there is always this sort of a, a of a subterranean need to rescue China as well as the father, as this historical mm-hmm. entity. Not get rid of it. Even when they talk about getting rid of it, they're still using its language. They're still using its idioms. What what I find wonderful about this introduction is he begins and ends with failure. His way forward is not, I saw this film in a classroom, film strip in a classroom in Japan. I decided I wanted to save the country, and that's why I'm writing. It's that bombed. And then we get his famous Iron House analogy with a colleague in which, of course, he says, you know, imagine an Iron House, no windows, no way out. You're awake. Everyone else is asleep. Do you wake everyone up? And, of course, his friend says, yes. And Lu Xun says, well, why? And his friend's answer is, well, effectively, you never know. Mm-hmm. And so he's writing because, not because we are the people and together we can do it. He's writing because, well, why not, basically? So, so let's think about his response to his initial failure to be a writer in Japan, his initial uh, failure to become the next Chinese Byron, right? He retreats to China. He takes on a number of different teaching positions. Uh, it, you know, he works for basically the Education Bureau of the Republic. Um, but basically, he doesn't write. He doesn't involve himself, at least in his narration, uh, doesn't involve himself in, in, in kind of the political social affairs. And he, he, quote, anesthetizes himself. He, he, he renders himself ma zui, uh, anesthetized. And remember, this is similar to the ma mu, the numbness of the Chinese people he saw in the Latin slide, right? Yeah. So he accused the Chinese people being numb. After his failure, he becomes numb himself. So he retreats. Uh, he starts, you know, copying old steely inscriptions, right? So talk about a dead language, yeah, like kind of living in the, in the ruins. Eileen uh, Chang has written beautifully about this. Um, it has remnants of what Hegel calls um, the beautiful soul, um, based on, I believe, Goethe. And this idea that rather than being in the hurly-burly of the secular world, of, of the world of life and death, uh, of tragedy and comedy, he retreats into the silence, the hermetic silence of the beautiful soul. Um, and, so th- and so that's where, you know, he's approached to write you know, these, these, these stories. And he says, no, 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 I can't, no, I won't do that because, you know, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. And um, the guy says, but, but you don't know. What he says, uh, Lu Shen says, is that he's right because hope belongs to the future. Zayu uh, hmm. lai. It's a spatial metaphor. It's zayu. It's in the future. It's just Physically, out of reach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just in the same way that the money and the herbal medicine was just out of reach in the pawn shop right. and the herbal medicine. This is an important thing because what he realizes was that his denial of hope, that w- was committing the same error as him claiming that he was the next Byron. Hmm. It's about self-determination, yeah. either positive or negative. Yeah. Either I will be the Byron or I will be nothing. Hmm. And those are the two choices. You're a Byron or you are nothing. Right. And what he figures out in that moment with this editor, it's probably Chen Du Xiu, I think he's referring to, is that it's a new way of conceiving of authorship, an authorship that is ventured, that is risked, but is not a bid for self-determination, not a bid for control or mastery. It is a surrender. So he's moving beyond this kind of romantic Ubermensch notion and, and coming to a sort of I mean, it's almost a different philosophical mm-hmm. register. Is that right? absolutely? Um, you know, I'm giving a conference paper in a couple of weeks where I'm trying to argue that in some ways the later Lucian is more like a Hegelian than a Nietzschean. Um, I, I sent you a copy, Rob, yeah, of that. Yeah. I don't know if you read that yet, um, but um, I don't know how that's going to be received. Um, but yes, what he, what he sees. Um, now, the thing is that, that that moment of the romantic moment is absolutely necessary. Uh, is absolutely necessary. He, he absolutely has to go through that education of hubris, that education of, I think I know what I'm doing as a young 20-year-old, you know, making out his way in the world in order to become the 40-year-old who is the great writer we know today, hmm. right? Life begins at 40, not at yeah, 20. Right. Uh, a lesson for all of us in this room. So true. It's so true. Yeah. And so I think that is kind of 
the the harder message to teach to 19 year olds undergraduates because that doesn't make a lot of sense. They're they're young, right? They want to believe in either everything's hopeful, so they're very optimistic, or they're totally goth and everything's hopeless, right? right. And what Lucian is saying is so there is an equivocal middle between the two that we must constantly dwell in. And that is where I shall dwell as an author. So he's not saying I reject any and all authorship. What he's rejecting is that his authorship necessarily arrogates a certain kind of cultural moral authority. He's saying, no, that is not in my hands. My authorship is something that I give to the world. Can I ask, is, is he being ironic there? Because, I mean, he's saying this after he is very successful, right? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if, if we should take that seriously or how seriously we should take it. Or is he saying it both on the level that is, is serious and, and also simultaneously kind of not serious? Well, I wanted to jump in there, too, because one of the, the amazing things this introduction does is it poses the question, what do you even mean by success? Because I thought I was going to be success twice, and both times I failed. And so at this point, I no longer think in those terms. So I don't read it as ironic, but not because not because he's not a success, but because that term doesn't really have any meaning anymore. Mm-hmm. When you wanted to save your father and you failed, then you wanted to be a revolutionary and you failed. Now you're a writer. What does that even mean? And so... To put it that that bluntly is actually a pretty daring way to start a collection of your own stories. <laughs> yeah, and that's what makes the zi and zi xu so ironic. Who is the zi, right? Who is Lu Xun, Zhou Shu, and whatever you name him, right? Um, and I think, you know, uh, th- I've been working a lot with the British philosopher Gillian Rose lately. Um, for some reason, during this pandemic lockdown, she came in a moment of crisis for me personally in the last year has really illuminated a lot of things that I've been kind of circling around, but hadn't really found the ways to think about this. So a lot of my new thinking has been as a result of, as a result of Jillian Rose's rereading of Hegel. Um, but, you know, she talks about the anxiety of authorship, right? That authorship always begins in equivocation. When does one start? How does one start? Why should one start? And to kind of deny that, to kind of deny that experience of anxiety is kind of to miss the whole boat. Right. And I think that is what we absolutely see in this text is Lucian's sense of anxiety Mm -hmm. of how do I start to write? How do I come to write? And in many ways, enveloping and embracing this as part of his authorship. Like he's not going to deny this anymore. He is not the ubermensch poet who's going to speak truth in a, you know, apostrophic style. He is going to take orders once in a while. Yeah. He's going to let people tell him what to change. You hey, know? you should write an article. All right, fine. Yeah. You should change his ending and make it more positive. And, right. you know, and this is one of the more problematic moments. Like, you know, how can Lucian sell out and literally change endings uh, of his stories because the editors say so? This is where I think we should take this a little ironically. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is for him to say, I, comp- I do not compromise. I write what I know. And I copy down bland steelies you in know, a friend's garden for no reason. You know, uh, yeah, you know, my way or the highway. That is something he's giving up. That for him is way worse, way worse yeah. than, you know, accepting a little, few editorial changes here right. and there. And yet, <clears throat> again, he, he couches this whole collection, Nahan, in a kind of forecasting, right? So I failed once, I failed again. Uh, who knows? This could be a failure too. I don't know. Um, and I think that sense of uh, not knowing what really is going to happen, what his legacy is really going to be, is what makes Nahan so fascinating because it's not a battle. I mean, it, it, it's it's called war cry, battle cry, outcry, whatever. But just because you're calling somebody to battle doesn't mean we're totally going to win this, right? You could all get mown down, right? You know, I, I wonder, I'm not an expert on Lucian and Nietzsche, in some ways, it's not a rejection of Nietzsche, as it is a reevaluation of, of, of the meaning of Nietzsche, right? Because you can have this kind of egoistic you know, idea of the Nietzschean kind of ubermensch who forms the world according to their own values and upends the values of the slave morality of Christianity, which is what Nietzsche was talking about. Um, but I think there's also, why does Nietzsche do this? It's because I think he's trying to point out 
the fragility of existence, the fragility of humanity. And so to try to guide ourselves by kind of shop-worn values, because that's what established Christianity says, this is what established morality tells us, is not going to guarantee our, our, our happiness. And so I think it's a reevaluation of the meaning of someone like Nietzsche about the contingency of life, the frailty of life, but he's letting go of this idea that he's going to then master it, that his way of kind of grappling with that anxiety is to try to kind of power through this. And we see this in our American politics for the last like eight years, right? You know, we feel insecurity, we feel anxiety, so I'm just going to become this kind of overblown bigot, right? Uh, he's saying, no, 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 no. The anxiety is real. The anxiety is there. But there's another, there are other ways of making sense of it and grappling and working with it. Can I ask, so we've been talking about him philosophically and how he's positioning himself, whether it's Nietzsche or Hegel, um, but we've been gesturing towards the Western philosophical tradition. I was kind of wondering, is he, is, is he thinking of himself as almost, is he, is he moving beyond sort of Nietzsche towards a Zhuangzian or a Taoist kind of Wu Wei position, or is, am, am I completely imagining that? I don't think it's Wu Wei, because Wu Wei means that one does no action. Right, one let 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 things come. He's not saying that he doesn't do action. It, is, it doesn't say that he doesn't claim authorship. He does, right? He writes under his name. Well, you know, of course, by the late twenties, he's using all kinds of pseudonyms. Um, so it's not. I don't think a kind of like you know, if I just do nothing, then everything will kind of come to pass. He recognizes that he has to stake himself. He has to venture himself in the enterprise, in the ordeal, with no guarantee. And so in some ways, you know, I, I don't know if it's like a hybrid of those, of those philosophies, um, other than to say that there's a lot of commonalities between Eastern and Western philosophies anyway. Um, right. but, but I think it's this kind of much more complicated notion of what does will mean? What does control mean? What does mastery mean? Um, how is the single-minded search for mastery its own undoing? Right. And this really starts to kind of sink into his ideas about kind of colonial power and the idea of the subjugation of whole peoples on a, on a colonial stage. And I believe that Lu Xun's decolonial politics is very much linked to these kind of philosophical ideas of how one grapples with violence, with oppression and with injury. A couple of just one or two parting thoughts here, because we're going we're gonna to chat again with uh, Roy about another Lushun piece that, Lee, I don't believe we have podcasted on yet, no. but it is, it is, in fact, my favorite Lushun piece, which is Wild Grass. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but just a kind of cl uh, closing thought from me, as a war cry, as I mentioned, this is notoriously mixed. Uh, it is nowhere near the, well call to battle that it would seem because Lu Xun himself, it, there are so many levels at work here. He himself is almost impossible to pin down either as a narrator or as a historical figure. And if you've never read War Cry or anything by Lu Xun, this is really where you need to start is to remember that by the time Lu Xun becomes famous, he no longer himself is completely sure what it is that everyone is doing. He only knows that you have to do something. I think that's a great place to end it. Uh, Professor Chan, thank you for joining us, and, and we look forward to the, the next podcast on Ye Sure, I'll see you in a bit. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.